Hello and welcome to Ritut Wotter Museum's museum podcast series. My name is Kerstin Robertsen and I am the museum manager at Kokel Sisame Museum. Today I have a guest with me. Can you introduce yourself? Sure, and thanks so much for having me. Um, I am Matthew Mignani, and I am currently an associate professor at UIT, the Arctic University of Norway. I am American, and I've been working in SAPMI since 2014. I finished my PhD at Harvard in 2021, and am happy to be moving back to the US to begin teaching at the University of Maine in the fall. So I've been working with these guys at RDM since around 2019. Yeah. So how did you get into this kind of work? Where did it start for you? OK, so I'm an archaeologist by training. And in the US, it's it's very closely related to anthropology. So I'm an anthropological archaeologist, which means I, I think about human behavior on really large timescales. And so I started my training as a paleolithicist which means somebody who is working deep in the Stone Age. And I started my dissertation and all of my work with um, Neanderthals, so hundreds of thousands of years ago, working in, in southern France. And it was here that I was introduced to these 3D technologies. So I came across people who were using photogrammetry and laser scanning, uh, which we could talk about in more detail through the, through the podcast. But uh, so I saw people applying these techniques to old archaeological remains. And as I progressed in my graduate career, I, I gained interest in, in working with more kind of contemporary and socially relevant issues. And so I dragged these technologies forward in time and began applying them in, in museums in Norway and Finland. Mm. So you mentioned some of the different types of technologies. Um, is there many types or is it just like some go to type types that you um, that you work with? Uh, so so there's a number of different ways that we could make a 3D model. And when we think about 3D models, right, you can think about uh, digital representations of objects that you're able to spin around on screens and zoom in on. And it's it's not a, a kind of replacement for holding an object, obviously. Right. But there's a lot of ways that having a 3D representation or a 3D model can can be useful. Uh, so so the, there's a number of different ways that we could make those. As, as you asked, there's photogrammetry, which in, includes like a, taking a lot of still photos. So you could do this even with your smartphone now uh, or, or an inexpensive digital camera. And basically what photogrammetry is, is taking lots and lots of pictures of an object or a room, uh, whatever you're interested in 3D modeling and then using a software to stitch those together. And this is a very inexpensive and easy way to make a 3D model. And there's more expensive ways of producing 3D models like laser scanning or white light scanner. And these are more complicated machines that um, right, tr that you kind of point and it shoots laser beams or, or white light. And based on the interference of those, of those beams or, or light sources, it recreates these geometries. And these are more expensive. So at RDM, we're fortunate to have um, and be using both kinds of technology, both both sort of the photogrammetric technologies and then also white light scanners, um, which which you guys were able to purchase in the last couple of years um, through through application to to Samidigi. And um, and so so either either or both technologies can be used and even combined to make 3D models for for use in, in museum contexts. Hmm. Um, so you mentioned you've been working with us. Um, can you tell me how has it been working with our museums? We are uh, four different museums and also an art collection for those that don't know us. Um, and both, how has it been working with us uh, for making the models for us? Because you've done, done that as well, but also teaching us how to do it ourselves and working alongside of um, our museums with projects. So. You guys, and, and I'll say this now, you guys have been so much fun to work with. And we we initiated workshops. So through, um, through I first came into contact with you guys at a conference in, in Trimso on 
on Sami museology. And at the time, one of your curators uh, came up to me and expressed interest in integrating 3D technologies at your consortium. And so from there, we ran a workshop on photogrammetry where I think all of your departments and museums were, were represented. Um, and again, so just taking photos and kind of jamming them into this computer program and trying to see how feasible it is for, for you at your different museums to make 3D models um, as, as you guys need. And so that was a really fun crash course. I don't know, how many, how many days was that? Was it like two or three days? Yeah, I or, think three or, days. Uh, so we ran this initial workshop, which was a, which was a blast, uh, and I felt an immediate connection with with all of you, and it was just a really fun experience. And then, as we moved through the pandemic, so we started this kind of question with this question of how how can these technologies be used by by your museums? How can we address the needs that are expressed by the kind of unique right institutions uh, that are represented under RDM, but then also uh, the right, of course. Th those are reflect the kind of communities across different this different this this larger region of Sapmi, um, and so over the pandemic, uh, there was there was I guess a little bit of extra funding uh, available, which I think Yelena and and Anamai applied for to receive uh, these kind of higher tech scanners that are used. Um, that, I mean, we were using those at Harvard, so it was really cool that you guys were able to get your hands on them. And, and since then we've been integrating them into um, kind of museum work. And now it's been, it's been since 2019. So we're coming on a few years and it's been just a wonderful working relationship to, to develop. Yeah, so those that um, don't know us, um, Anamai is our uh, director and Yelena is the um, museum manager in uh, Karashok. Just so people know. Um, how can we use this kind of technology in museums? What types of objects um, can we can we make models of and have you um, tried making models of some objects that you can't seem to work out oh so this, this is a fun question and, and you you are an expert i'll have to give you credit for for being an expert <laughs> at finding the most difficult materials and so we've had a lot of fun i think together testing each technology with the different uh, types of materials mm. um, so for instance each, so each technology interacts with objects. So whether it's cloth, cloth of gakti, or or wood or antler of of hard doji, um, each technology interacts with the materials in very different ways. And so we've been trying to work out uh, from more of a right, an indigenous mu museological perspective how these technologies can serve um, interests in local museums and communities. And um, so so we've been We've been testing now and, and are, have been applying this in a number of different domains. One, I think we're really curious to see how uh, the 3D models we make can be useful for doyorat or, or artisans in, in Sapmi. So, so getting back to that testing of, of materials and, and what you've been doing has been really important, right? Because you've been bringing a variety of, of materials from Kokel and we've been testing them. And it's, it is a frustrating process, right? Making a 3D model is is not necessarily easy and there's not a lot of um there's not necessarily a lot of precedence for for using them in in the kinds of applications so that so that is lots of people make 3d models now uh, but from making them in a way that's going to be most useful in museum context in sapme is a different is a kind of different question um, and so this provides a lot of opportunities um, the technology provides a lot of opportunities to reach into foreign institutions and collections, right? So this is one of the major ways that I've been thinking about this with, with Yelena uh, Porsanger again. Um, she's been identifying uh, places where, where, they, where, where Sami material culture is held abroad and then using the technology to, to bring these materials, digital representations of these materials uh, back into view in Sapmi. Um, and so it's never, again, it's never going to be a replacement for having the actual objects back. And that's something that is really important to, to be clear about. Um, bringing back a digital representation is not, is not uh, always going to be the goal, right? Physical repatriation is often the kind of the, the crown jewel that, that should be sought in many cases, um, though not all. Um, 
And so, but but this kind of begins dialogue. It begins a discussion on the history of of Sami collections and and the movement of Sami materials abroad. Um, in, in some cases, and the 3D technology facilitates this. Um, on the other hand, and, and you guys, the curators at the museum have expressed a lot of concern over, over conservation. So, so there's a lot of interest in making models of things that you may not want to handle all of the time or uh, for right, because it, an object is too delicate. Um, and Anna Mai Ali, who, who did her, her master's thesis on, on Sami collections and has emphasized uh, the how much pesticide is in in these materials has also raised really val valid avenues to to pursue right because there there are things that you're not going to want to handle um, and perhaps a 3D model of something that's heavily contaminated by pesticides is advantageous for for the study or recreation of of Sami material culture um, so so there's a number of different avenues that are emerging using this technology and it has been very uh, to keep with the pesticides it's been very organic um, in, in a sense uh, right because so it's it's going to be a valuable tool for repatriation in international dialogue local conservation um, and you know and and even health uh, in in some cases when when you're not going to want to handle handle these things yeah so you mentioned uh, uh, Sami objects in other museums and also internationally um, you and Yelena went uh, to uh, Germany and also Sweden. Can you talk a little bit about uh, your work there? What, what did you do there? Sure. So this was planned for the 50-year exhibition, so which which Jelena uh, ran at at SVD in in Kodoshuk, uh, the the Sami collections in Kodoshuk. And as a part of this, there was an integration of three-dimensional models of, of drums that were appropriated historically from, from Sapmi. Um, and many of these drums were taken to, I mean, so they were dispersed across major collections in Europe, and some, some of them ended up in, in Germany, and others in, in Sweden and the United Kingdom, and, you know, all over the place. There's, there's around 70, something that are that are still in existence and many others were destroyed and so while these drums were not physically in Sapmi bringing back digital representations raises them to public consciousness and and sort of was integrated in this in this museum exhibition on the return of of the Sami drums and in, in the context again of of Ander Paulsen's drum which was which was signed over from from Denmark this year uh, fortunately after after 40 years of of being on on uh, on essentially long term loan um so what we found when Jelen and I traveled to to Germany and Sweden to three different institutions was that creating 3D models of these of these drums was was an avenue for discussion um and and helps prompt even conversations on their physical repatriation, which was was very interesting and surprising because again, I started using this technology to to model uh, really old stone tools, um, and so to see to see the the use of this technology be really actively used as a as a means to encourage kind of important social agendas in in Sapmi is is very is kind of exciting and, and even unexpected uh, for, for me. Yeah, so you mentioned the um, the anniversary exhibition. So there's a 50 year anniversary exhibition uh, at the museum in Karashok this year. Um, they have used the uh, 3D models there. What kind of, I guess, new alternative uh, ways of uh, displaying objects in exhibitions are there that you know of? And uh, what, what kind of um, ways have they used them in the exhibition in Karashok? Sure, so this is a really interesting and yeah, I encourage everybody to get up to this museum to, to check it out, check it out themselves. Mm -hmm. um, so so this was a really cool exhibition that brought together the expertise of many different, many different people uh, within the Sami community and and beyond uh, to tell the story of of the history of the of the appropriation of drums and and their contemporary meaning. Uh, and it really helps shape their contemporary meaning in, in society um, on, on many different levels. 
so the 3D technology, I'm happy, you know, and proud that this could support this this kind of this kind of message. And in the main exhibition hall, so again, I made I made the 3D models and and all of the conceptualization and all, and everything else um, was they they were kind of just slotted into this very very elaborate and and complex museum exhibition making process. Um, so so the way they were ultimately uh, used by by the exhibition uh, designers and director of of the museum was um, to be projected on the on the walls. And so the pulse and drum is center central in the room. Um, and and around this are drums that have been yet to be uh, repatriated. And they're projected on the walls by by very large projectors. I don't know how many how many meters do you think those those things are across? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> they're big. They're probably like it's probably like four. You know, they're probably three, four, or five meters across. Yeah, they're huge. They're, so they're very large projections. So this is this is mm -hmm. one way that you could use them, and um, and these were animated quite beautifully. So so the animator took the took the three D models and changed the lighting and the cadence of their movement um, and presented them in a very um, what I think comes across as a very kind of respectful but also um, dramatic kind kind of way really conveying the the materials of of these of these drums or or persons um and so that that's one way so so they're being projected very dynamically through through animation uh there's also a number of different ways that these models can be integrated into kind of more traditional museum exhibitions or or in other media so there, so there's lots of holographic projectors that are coming on the scene now and what we could basically do is take uh, again, these 3D models, and take the animated video and jam them into the projector. Uh, sorry, these these 3D holographic projectors to give them a lot of depth and and make it look like objects that are housed elsewhere, which again is very relevant in in Sami contexts and many other indigenous contexts uh, because of these colonial histories. You could kind of emphasize, make them like they're in the room, but but obviously uh, articulate that they that they are not because they'll still be clearly holograms. Um, you could also integrate them into into touch screens um, and all sorts of other all sorts of other panels um, to uh, to allow visitors to kind of interact with them. Uh, although this takes more kind of programming prowess, um, and and ultimately as well, right? So they could be used in presentation, uh, and we also want to be able to reach the the artisans who are actually recreating and and making making these materials in contemporary society. Um, and so we want to be able to use the media to eventually kind of very cautiously keeping in mind issues of cultural appropriation and right with a 3D model now you can you can print these things you could do all sorts of things with them that you wouldn't have been able to do before um, so we want to get the use this technology to reach people who are using going to use them to support and you know and develop the culture in a sense um, Although that's a, right, that's a, that's a maybe problematic word to use to to engage these materials um, on on Sami terms and and not uh, not misuse them. We don't we don't want them to end up being you know plastered on the design of a you know whatever or or printed out on on playing cards sold out sold for for five euros in in Rovaniemi. Um, so so there's a lot of ways that these can be used, um, and then also protecting against their potential misuse is also high on high on the agenda. Yeah. So you you just touched on um, one of the the cons. We we talked a lot, of, or you've talked about um, a lot of the pros of this uh, technology, but uh, there's also quite a lot of cons. So dangers with these. Um, with the data of these models, can you talk a little bit more about that and why? Why is it bad um, if people print, say, an object from the Sami culture? So, so right. So there. So like, like you said, there we we started out with all of the positive positives and potentials, and there's nothing inherently wrong with with 3D printing, right? Anything, uh, but it's it's in the context of kind of right these these long term histories of of appropriation of the material culture that we want to think about being very cautious moving moving forward. So in other words, um, right, we know when we travel to um, these institutions that are housing um, Sami material culture, for instance, there's there tends to be maybe 
poor poor information off, often right on on these objects there's they're they're of course out of their cultural context and have been collected over a century and have trickled in over for many over over many many years um so when objects are removed from their from their cultural context and and they oftentimes lack any any context in in many institutions or or are mislabeled and so on if if you then make these collections available um, for for three D printing, um, they can. It might not always be appropriate from from the kind of descendant communities' uh, perspectives. So, so what we're working to do now is a kind of develop a kind of cautious approach to how these how these files should be used. Um, and it's it's not that that's that's not going to be appropriate in every context. But the the point that I try to make through my work is that it's very important to ask first. Um, so before before ma major museums make 3D models of, of indigenous cultural heritage that, that can be used in these ways, that it's very important to develop relationships um, with, with these communities to understand the, the potential pitfalls uh, or, or dangers of doing so. And just to give you some examples, and I won't name any institutions, uh, but it's currently possible to print out um, Sami death masks, right? So there, there are museums where um, they have scanned like plaster uh, faces of, of deceased individuals and those can be printed out. And okay, that's kind of, that's kind of out of touch to begin with. But then when you see how people um, are, are using them, people are printing them out in ceramics and using them in as flower pots. Um, you know, this is, this is just one example um, and there are there are many others, right? Because when somebody provides a file online and encourage uh, it's it's kind of remixing in a sense or or reuse under these terms of Creative Commons licenses, uh, you don't know what's what's going to happen. And and I think many people now who are working with this working with this technology, and particularly those who have close working relationships with indigenous institutions um, and individuals are just saying like, hey, like let's let's slow down a little bit um, and let's make sure that we understand what it, what we could do in a respectful way um, to, to increase access to museums, but also be conscientious of all of these local cultural sensibilities. And we expect that, I expect that to be very different, right? At each of these, even, even across your institutions, right? What, how, how it might be appropriate to use a 3D model or community interests in, in Kolkhelv surrounding the use of this technology are going to be different from how they are in Kodoshok, uh and and Kautikeno and and even in this even in this small region there's going to be many different sensibilities um, and so it's I think it's the job of people in museums to to kind of have have these conversations and then use these technologies more more wisely. Yeah. Um, you mentioned earlier that you started out with, uh, you know, uh, objects thousands of years old. What's the difference uh, with working uh, with 3D modeling of um, archaeological finds versus objects from indigenous cultural heritage where the culture is very much still alive? That's a very good question. So, so I mentioned before that I'm American and I started my career as an American working in France. And so interestingly, the the use of these technologies when I, when I was using this originally um, it, it would still right it still existed in a cultural context uh, but just in a very in a very different one so the ethics were very the ethics of of representation are very different so the the initial conversations that I was having in France were surrounding um, right there was concern over maybe illustrators being phased out because one of the most kind of essential ways to um, depict stone tools, for instance, is to illustrate them. And there's this mentality in in the across the academy in, in archaeology that to really understand something, you either have to be able to make it or you have to be able to draw it. And so when I started using this technology, I was like, I don't, I don't want to draw. I don't want to draw these things. Uh, and there's a lot of alternatives that we can use to uh, to, to make our lives kind of easier that that show the same kind of features and maybe even more I don't want to use the word objectively right but I mean when you're scanning something and it's it's very reproducible no matter who is doing it uh, you, you know it's it's not as um, it's not as error prone um, with caveats of course 
um, that as as an illustration, which which is very dependent on on people's skills and agreement on these conventions and so on. And so in in this context, it was more about the use of the technology was was entering into these kind of com conversations of and headbutting between French and Americans, which is very is very normal um, for for different in international traditions to to come into contest with each other. Uh, but the ethics are not there in the same sense. Uh, and there's more of an an attitude of open access, right? That's gripping everybody. So so there's more of an idea in archaeology um, and and harder sciences. Um, although archaeologists who work with indigenous communities express the same kind of sensibilities about data protection, uh, to, to be clear. Uh, but right, there's more of an idea of, oh, if you excavate a site and you um, have all of this information, you should share it so it's it's reproducible. And and you could argue very easily that when you're dealing with something that's, a, you know, 120,000 years old, it, it doesn't matter. It doesn't affect any living communities that much. Maybe living communities of scientists or or, you know, maybe people who live in close proximity to the site, but again, we're talking about about southern France, so it's not not as in, invasive as necessarily as, as other areas of the world. Okay, so the ethical conversations, the discussion in, in that kind of realm are very very different. And when you enter into the use of these technologies in in indigenous communities, the the game completely changes, right? Because all of a sudden, you're not talking about descendants of Neanderthals. And I guess there are, you know, of course there are there are some to this day. There's a little bit of admixture, and and people from many different regions of the world. Um, but we're talking about um, people whose whose parents and grandparents, and within very um, within very recent memory, have have given objects or made objects or had objects taken from them um, that are now in in major institutions. And so the ethical questions that are raised by this are are immediately different, um, and and need to be very carefully thought through. Um, and so that's another strength of your your museum consortium, in a sense, because there's every, everybody's willing and aware of how how these technologies can can be beneficial, um, but also is everybody's very critical also um, about how they might be used in in problematic ways. So these conversations on ethics are very important to to have um, and and to be led by, you know. So so I've been really fortunate to be working with so Yelena again, um, who's really taken taken the lead in in developing what it means to use these technologies to support indigenous uh, desires and goals um, in, on, on the level of institutions and and communities. Um, and so it's important to have these kind of conversations, uh, which are very different from. From their application in other other domains like archaeology or even other other areas of cultural heritage, where where it might be more linked to, right? Not not a three D model of everything isn't going to be uh, offensive, um, but but there are cases where where we need to think very carefully through through these issues. Yeah, are you going to keep working with uh, with Sami objects now that you're back in the U.S., or are you going to move on with other things? Ooh, so even though I physically moved moved out of out of uh, northern Norway, which is is sad in some ways, right? Being at University of Tromsø had many um, many elements that made me want to pull my hair out. Like, but it was it was very close. I could get in the car and be over to to Kattershok, you know, in in a day. And so the benefit of being close, um, I think, has really allowed this program to flourish. But that being said, the relationships that I've built with you guys and and the people in this in this region um, now are are very strong, and I'm looking forward to making them stronger through my work in the U.S. So so for instance, um, and as I'm sure you know, right there's a there's a group being organized to come over to the Smithsonian in in about a month, a, a little bit less than a month now, and so our goal is to now reconnect um, indigenous institutions and communities with material culture that's that's diasporic. And so the the collections at the Smithsonian are relatively small. They're less than, it's approximately 60 objects, but in this collection are very many important uh, important things. There's there's the inside of the Lajik Apir or the Fiera, the piece of the of a Sami woman's um, hat or or headdress that that's being 
revived in many northern areas of Sápmi. Um, and there's an example of this at the Smithsonian. There's a piece um, that was carved by by Lars Hetta in the 18 in the 1850s while he was imprisoned in in Oslo um, that made its way somehow over to the United States. And so just just as an idea of what what exists elsewhere, right? This is one institution. It's a very large American institution. But now one of the things that I'm going to begin to do while working from the U.S. is to is to begin conversations with all of these institutions uh, to build relationships and and also right see see what's there and just sort of begin this information finding process that that will lead to 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 greater conversation and an exchange about, of information about issues like repatriation um, and then also best practices for this digital work that, that we've been talking about through this through this episode. Yeah, exciting. It's going to be a fun trip. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's going to be. I, I'm I'm so thrilled. Washington D.C. in the summer is like a. Uh, we're all going to be, like a puddle of sweat. <laughs> it's so humid. It's so humid, and uh, you know, it's it's probably the worst time to go to Washington D.C. But we'll we'll see if anybody's if anybody's brave enough to wear their gakti. Yeah, they're probably gonna they're gonna be weighed down by like, you know, fifty pounds of extra water. Yeah, it will have to be a summer gakti. <laughs> <laughs> Even so. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's going to be interesting to see what comes from this uh, this visit to the Smithsonian in uh, in DC. It's going to be really interesting. Um, thank you very much for speaking with me on this very interesting subject, Matt. Yeah, no, thanks for thanks for hosting me, and we look forward to giving you more updates as this project develops with with RDM both in Sápmi and and abroad. Thank you. And to our listeners, uh, we will be back with a new podcast episode next week, which will be in Norwegian. Thank you for listening. <laughs>